Hi, my name is Mick Fletcher and I'm here today to talk about building a shipping container home. For some of y'all that don't know who I am, uh, I actually run the Nashville PowerShell user group and just spoke over here teaching PowerShell. I got off on this kick that I wanted my own home over in uh, Land Between the Lakes, Tennessee, so I told my wife, I said, we're going to build our own house. So some of the topics we're going to talk about today is why would you ever want to use a shipping container for a house? Talk about the design of it, local laws and codes, uh, your insurance, required skills, what you got to know to build your own house, especially a shipping container, uh, your tools, you know, taking a long break after you get started. <laughs> and then uh, where you can buy shipping containers, outside help, and then finally actually getting down to building your house. So first thing, why would you ever want to use a shipping container? Well, cost is number one. You buy a shipping container, and I paid $3,250 per container. They're cheap compared to, you've got an instant four walls, roof, and a, uh, and a floor. So for $3,250 for a steel container, that's not too bad. Uh, your durability, you've got core 10 steel structure there, which basically you, it will rust at some point, but it's designed to rust the core 10 steel is and not actually uh, be compromised. Your design. Well, how big of a home do you want? Well, this is a weekend home my wife and I are building. And it's over at Land Between the Lakes, which is 80 miles west of Nashville. So we, we don't want a big home, but we want something that's uh, energy efficient and a place that we can get away to on the weekends to go over and hunt, fish, kayak, four wheel, we love doing all that outdoor stuff. Uh, is your home gonna be connected to local, local utilities? Ours is not. Uh, ours is completely eco-friendly uh, green home. So we don't have to worry about any of that. Is the home going to be underground? Uh, half of our home is underground already. Uh, put two sides of it completely under, reinforced it, and that gives it a lot of um, cooling effect off the ground. Uh, you want your home to be eco-friendly. We did. We've put ours, as I said earlier, completely off the grid, so it's not consuming any natural resources from the uh, energy, water, any of that. It's all using the environment, what it provides. And is this going to be a full-time or vacation home? These are some of the big questions you need to ask yourself before you ever start building your own house, especially a container house. Um, this is just a vacation home that we're building that we want to go over there on weekends and get away and have fun and maybe spend a week over there sometimes depending on the season. Now, this is a big one right here. Before you ever start building, you need to know the local laws and codes. When I first started out with this project, I wanted to know, is this thing even legal? And that's a huge point because if you planned on doing it here, it's not legal in the least. You can't build it in Davidson County or any of the surrounding counties. They wouldn't allow this. And you're going to waste your money if you buy your property and then realize you can't build your own house the way you want. Uh, utility hookup, that's part of the legality. In many of these cities, you have to have utility hookup. And this comes from the International Building Standards Code. The International Building Standards Code says that you have to be connected to the water system and you have to be connected to electricity in order for it to be a viable home and to be uh, sanitary. Well, that's outdated. Those codes were last updated in 2006. Technology in the last 10 years has increased exponentially. You don't need a connection, but these cities still go by it. Uh, there's two cases right now. There's one in Huntsville, Alabama, and there's one, in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's Boca Raton, Florida. Both the people, not, they're not shipping container homes, but they cut the utilities off completely, went composting toilets, have their own solar panels, and they, their homes have been condemned. And the uh, utilities and the uh, local cities are going after them to, uh, to make them get out of their own house because they're no longer connected. So these are some big, big things that you need to find out before you ever do it. Now where I'm building over at LBL, 
there are no building codes at all for me. Um, and the reason is, which is one of the reasons I'm building over there, I'm a hunter, is the fact that a lot of hunters have built their own cabins over in that area. And so all they want is shelter. They want to go out and hunt for the day, come back in the evening, and just have uh, a roof over their head. That's why they don't have building codes in that area. The only two codes I have over there is electricity and water, and those codes only apply if I actually connect it to the grid, which I'm not. We're not forced to connect to it. And that's, like I said, because of those hunting cabins over there. So that's a big thing. HO homeowners associations, property owner associations, are there those? If there's either one of those, the likelihood that you're gonna be able to build is almost nil. Now, where I'm building, I'm, we're building on a cul-de-sac that's right on Lake Barkley. It goes, it comes right around the road does, and we do have a POA. Uh, but POA, because this is a, a not a trailer, the POA has the fact that you can't build a trailer in our uh, neighborhood. But because these are shipping containers, they don't fall under a trailer <laughs> definition. And because I'm going to build an outside brick wall over the shipping container, they can't say anything, even though they tried to at first. So that's, these are some really big questions. And then your property taxes. You know, I went online, and there's lots of people that have blocked that have built houses just like I'm building. And I went online, and I asked them, I said, so how is your house classified for property taxes? You know not a single person would respond to me. They all told me, uh, I won't talk about that. I couldn't get any answer out of anyone. So I basically went, and luckily enough, I work for a law firm that has real estate attorneys there. And I got some help from them, and I went to the local property um, assessment people there in Stewart County, Tennessee, and I asked them, I said, so what is this house going, is this house going to be legal? Either are there gonna be legal problems with me building this? How's the taxation going to come along? Well, they had no answer for me. And so they ended up uh, classifying the house as a uh, storage facility. They had no other classification. They couldn't classify it as a trailer because it's not a, a, a single wide or a double wide. So the, these are some real issues here that it, apparently I'm one of the first ones that has actually come out in public and talked about. Because I'm, I'm just purely guessing that other people wouldn't say anything because they pretty much skirted the law. Went ahead and built it and Hopefully nobody will ever say anything. So these are, and then your other thing is insurance. What are you gonna do about insurance for your house? We, we've had no problems with that. I've got building insurance right now. We went through Farm Bureau and they had no problems. They've got other people that have built shipping container homes and have been completely off the grid. So they, they were great. They accepted it right off. Uh, other, other, one other thing that you're going to have what with this is, once you're done, how are you going to uh, get somebody out there to inspect it? So no put a value on it for you. So you need to think about that too. Uh, I know where I'm building it. Likely there's not going to be anybody out there that has experience in doing an inspection on this house. Um, you know, that it's not on the grid. That it's got its own energy source, got its own water source. So you got to, you got to find people that will come in and be able to assess those type and you features. There's, there's no building codes as, as well, is that what they just Right, there are no building codes out there. There, there. there are building codes if you connect to the grid, but connecting to the grid out there is not required. So I don't fall under anything because I'm, I'm going to be, uh, the house is completely uh, self-sustaining. So... When will you have it built? Well, the house is uh, almost built. We're actually framing out right now. Uh, we finished framing actually the whole inside and we're getting ready to um, actually connect the water this weekend. And uh, all the rooms are built out. We're getting ready to start putting the wood floors, wood walls in. So we're, we're really getting close and I've got a whole bunch of pictures on here to, to show what you're seeing. So as I was saying on the insurance, those are some of the things um, that you need to look at if you ever consider one of these. Uh, one other thing is, people come come up to me and they think I'm a doomsday prepper, and I'm not. That's one of the biggest things I get is, oh, you must be a doomsday prepper. Well, I mean, the reason I'm, I'm building the house the way it is is because number one, I want it eco-friendly. I don't want to be dependent on the utilities. 
And if my wife and I decide we want to do something else for a month or two and we aren't going to go back, I don't want any bills coming out of the house. I want it completely zero uh, bills, zero charges to us while we're gone from there. And that those are the real reasons why uh, to be green and, and cost effective, to have a second home that um, just easy to keep. Because as like we've said about our own house, it's a pain in the butt. After a while trying to, you really gotta constantly upgrade stuff, maintain and all, well we wanted low maintenance on this other house. So these are a lot of the reasons why we went with shipping containers. So if some of your required skills, oh there's definitely skills you gotta have. You gotta be a welder. That, I can tell you right now, with all the hours, I've put in almost 140 hours of welding and plasma cutting. And we're talking probably fifteen to twenty thousand dollars right there of work that I did myself. So you, unless you want to spend that out on it, you definitely should be a welder. Welding is not hard to learn. I learned in 2009. I taught myself how to weld. Taught myself how to plasma cut. It's it's an easy easy one that a lot of people put a lot more fear into than they should. I mean, it's it's not a hard skill. You just got to have patience. Um, plasma cutting torch, you definitely need uh, to know how to use that. If you know how to weld, you can plasma cut. It's basically a welder with an air compressor that blows the, as it the melts the steel, it blows the steel away. Um, ingenuity, you definitely need that. You got to be able to think outside the box. Because I can tell you right now, from my experience of building this house, I had everything planned out at the start. I knew exactly how I wanted it done. And then when I started building it, lots of stuff changed. I mean, changes even up to now. Uh, and basic building. You need to know basically how to do basic building tasks. Uh, how to put walls up. Uh, I mean, we made some big mistakes at first doing that. And I'll tell you right now, YouTube is going to be your friend. YouTube and Google. I've used those two lots learning on how to uh, frame walls, how to put insulation in, how to do spray foam, all that stuff. So you definitely... The, those skills are your critical skills right there. Uh, your required tools, you definitely need a plasma cutter or a torch. Um, you can use a, an angle grinder instead of those, but I started out, I watched some YouTube videos, how others had framed out shipping containers. I started out using uh, angle grinders and they take forever. And you go through one wheel right after another. I went through 18 wheels, for instance, just doing one wall on that. So it wasn't long I bought a plasma cutter and learned how to use that and then I just zip right through cutting those walls out. So you definitely want to uh, have a plasma cutter or a uh, cutting torch. Uh, welder, I want a MIG welder. You don't need a big one. I have a, a Hobart 140 which plugs right into your normal uh, 110 outlet and it works great over there. It can weld up to quarter inch steel so you don't have any problems with, with any of your welding. I mean, it takes longer, and you, uh, you don't need um, gas with it. You can use uh, flux core, which means it basically has a, a core inside the, the welding steel cable that creates the gas cloud around it for it to uh, properly weld. So, just need a basic um, MIG welder. Uh, hoist, you're definitely gonna need a hoist. You got lots of steel you're gonna be bringing in because you're gonna have to reinforce the shipping container. Uh, truck, SUV with a trailer, you definitely need that a lot too. My Jeep Wrangler out there, I've used that thing for everything and I mean I've even overused what that Jeep should have been used for, hauling steel. Um, you're going to need an air compressor, you definitely need a compressor out there. Uh, you're going to need that for your plasma cutter because that's how plasma cutters work. You take the compressed air and blow through and as, it, as I said, as it cuts, it blows the steel away. Uh, and plus you probably need it for painting too because it, it, your painting process will go a lot lot faster. Uh, you'll definitely need an angle grinder. There's going to be stuff that you're going to have to uh, sand down. Use wire brush. you need that and a drill. Those are your main things you're going to need the tools uh, for doing this besides your, your basic tools like screwdrivers, pliers, all those things. You'll need that. Do you have a generator when you're doing this? Or? Yes. Yes. I have a, um, a 6,000 watt generator over there. Um, after you get this stuff, take a long break. 
I mean, take a really long break. When I started this project in 2013, I left uh, the last company I worked at and came to the uh, current law firm I'm at now. And I was so busy the first year, I had no time at all to go over. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me. I had this, as I said earlier, I had this house completely thought out. Uh, we were gonna build up concrete block wall and we were at foundation, drop the container, get a crane in there, drop the containers down on it, and voila, we were gonna have a house. I'm so glad I didn't do it that way. It really helped me because that year that I couldn't go over there every weekend and work, it gave me time to really think this through, how it should actually be built, and to come up with new thoughts. So take a long, literally, once you've got your, your property, once you've got some of your stuff, Take a long break and really think this out before you get started. Because it would have looked completely different and it wouldn't have nearly the features today that I put into it that I originally thought. So that's an important thing to do. Uh, buying your shipping containers. I get that a lot. People say, well, where did you ever find these being here in Nashville? Well, I'm lucky on this one. Where I'm building over there, land between the lakes, there's a guy down the road that goes to Memphis and buys them and sells them 10 miles down the road from over there. So I was really, really lucky on that. But if you're in Nashville, they sell them right over on um, Briley Parkway at the, across from the Nashville Gun, Gun Club there uh, in West Nashville. It's really, you can, you can see them right there. It's right beside the prison. Um, and they're visible right from Briley Parkway. So they're not hard to come by. You can also go on eBay. They're sold on Craigslist. You can literally go on there and buy them here in Nashville. And Facebook groups. You can go on there and ask for them. The Clarksville Facebook groups up there, they have shipping containers for sale that different um, trucking companies sell. So it's not hard to find them. And outside help. That's one of your big, big, big things that you need to also get. That's another thing I'm very lucky about. Where I'm building over there, there are uh, there's one guy down the road from me that owns his own construction company, and he's been down helping me when I've needed backhoeing and uh, clearing the land and all that stuff. He just drove right down the road. He's a half mile from me with all that stuff. But you're going to need people there. You need to definitely know who you're going to call, like to excavate your land, um, clear it all out. I started clearing it out at first in 2013. And it took me an entire weekend just to do a small part of it. He came down with the backhoe and he did it within an hour. Cleared the entire lot. So you definitely get some construction people in there. And usually, I'll tell you right now, it's $500 to rent a backhoe for a day. This guy charged me 100 bucks to drive down the road and do it. 100 an hour. And he's been a huge, huge help with this stuff for me. So you definitely need to know who you're, who you're going to get to help with that. Engineers, you, you should definitely get an engineer to help. Uh, the last firm I worked at, that was an architecture and engineering firm. So I got a lot of knowledge from them. And luckily, I'm in the same building still. Because then they're only seven floors down from my current office. So I see them in the lobby, and I get to ask questions today. From them. But seriously, you definitely need an engineer if you're going to build something like this because when you start taking your walls out, you will structurally compromise the shipping containers. And you need to know where to put your supports and such. If you're worried about cost, I'll tell you right now, you can go on upwork.com, get an engineer on there, and you can get an engineer for probably 100 bucks that would be able to do the design work for you. Um, Otherwise, you're probably talking five hundred to a thousand dollars for an engineer locally. Yeah. Um, a builder, you're probably going to need a builder on some of the things that you're going to do. Uh, like, for instance, when we started out, we needed a lot excavated. I had to get a guy in there with his backhoe. Not the guy down the street. I didn't know about him at the time. But I got another one to come in and help me, and he helped with some of that. A plumber. You're going to need. Actually, what you need is you need a plumber, builder, and electrician need them to come in. I've done all the work myself, but I don't trust myself either. I'm not under codes, but I want somebody else to come in and say, hey, your work is okay. Especially on stuff when it comes to like plumbing, gas, and electricity. So you definitely want to make sure you get some of those people on hand. Um, an attorney, probably need an attorney there. 
um, because if you're building a shipping container, you might want to have them uh, check the walls for you. Or if they're going to hassle you before you start building, you may need to get a, uh, an attorney to represent you for that. A surveyor, oh yeah. Surveying is easy. I, I learned that in my last job, how to survey, and I surveyed my lot. I ended up being eight inches off. It's not hard if you can get the deed. You get your deed and you read the uh, specs in there. It's really easy because you'll find the markers, the way they describe in there, how to do it. But definitely get a surveyor because somebody in the same neighborhood where I'm building didn't, and he built off on somebody else's property part of it, and now they're in court. So you definitely want to get your property surveyed. So getting started, first thing, like I said there, start with a surveyor, get your lot surveyed, make sure you got all your boundaries marked, clear your land, and designate um, where your house is going to be. Mark it off. Get your little markers like from Tractor Supply and start marking all that. So, excavation and the foundation. That's the first thing we did after we uh, cleared everything on the lot. And there was the first thing we did. So, I'm building on a hill. That was part of what I said originally. We were going to build it up on blocks, concrete cinder blocks. And then we were going to have the crane layer, uh, lower the container down the block. Well, instead, we dug it out and we made that a uh, smooth place right there and we put the containers down in that. So I started doing, this is one of the things that I backed out on. So I started putting in the foundation there, putting all the uh, wood in to have the concrete foundation laid. And then I realized I was in over my head on the concrete part. So I got a guy to come in and do that part for me. You just gotta know stuff that, if you have a hunch that you can't do it, don't do it. Because I knew this was a critical thing right here and I didn't wanna mess something up with the foundation where the house is going to be compromised. So I got a guy to come in and I, he did it to my specs. As you can see right here, since they're shipping containers, what I had him do is inlay steel beams down inside the uh, foundation of it. And then when the shipping containers were uh, brought in, I welded the containers straight to those steel beams so that they're welded to the foundation. So that was one of the best things I did, getting a guy to come in and actually help do the foundation instead. So the placement of the container. So there's when the container arrived. That's the guy bringing it in. And he just brought it in with a pickup truck. We had a big dually wheel pickup truck and the, the, each container, these are 40 foot long by, uh, they're called high cubes because they're 10 feet high. So they're uh, almost 10,000 pounds each. And he brought it in there and we uh, let it slide down the hill there. <laughs> and then I got the guy down the street, the construction guy I said that lived down the road a half a mile down. We hooked a chain to his backhoe and honestly, I never knew backhoes were as powerful as they are until I did this. And that backhoe, as you can see, he's pulling it right in place. And I was hoping this would work here. Let me see if it asked to enable. Well, I guess my YouTube video isn't working, but I've got a YouTube video out there of, of it actually being pulled into place. Oh, I bet that's what it is. Nope, thanks. Okay, that's a screechy noise. <laughs> yep. It pretty much was. Ah, thanks. Think so as you can see right here, and it's pulling 10,000 pounds like it's nothing. And that's all it's to putting it in place. So 
There it was once we pulled it all fully in place. That was the first one. And there we go, we, we got the second one in there. And that's after the second one got pulled into place. Now we realized afterwards that after he left there, that they weren't completely pulled into place together. Because my next task was welding these together. So before, uh, before he left though, he did go ahead and that's actually him and he uh, created my driveway. So he went ahead while he was there, after he pulled my containers in place, he went ahead and took tobacco and um, ditched out or cut out all the driveway portion for me and didn't charge me anything more for it. So if you can get somebody down there with a backhoe, get as much work as possible done each time. Make sure you know everything that needs to be done because it's, it's not cheap. So there's what happened. After he had already left, I had to hook it to my Jeep and I had to pull the container into place myself, that steel cable. So, yeah. Did it break? Nope. Well, I, I welded and then built my own rack um, with 3 8 inch steel on that Jeep. So, yeah, it pulled it. I used to come along and pulled it right into place there. So the next thing is now, now that they're actually together, it's connecting the containers. So as you can see, you can see the little uh, line down in between them there. Uh, yes, this is out. And actually I've got a, a thing in the few, in a few slides up. I'm going to show you as I'm taking the walls out. So yeah, I mean, I'd already cut the walls out in here, but you can see where they're, they're connected or I need to connect them together inside. And that's what I, the next thing I did, I, I welded the um, plate down there in the center together so that the inside of them were connected. And so on the top of the containers, as you can see, there's a, um, there's a it's called, uh, they're styrofoam rods. And you basically, when you run into a big section, because the containers, when you bring them together, they're about still about this wide apart. So what you have to do is you have to take these styrofoam rods and wind them together and you bring it down and then you use what's called self-leveling uh, caulk and you just put it all the way down that self-leveling caulk and then that seals the uh, two containers together. And then after I did that, I welded the, um, the steel, the quarter inch flat steel all the way down the seam of that. So now they're, they're completely welded together. So after that, back to where, where I had it before where you saw them uh, split apart, I did a, just a little sliver in between them I cut out because when you start cutting these walls out, they're structurally compromised. So that's why I uh, cut just a little sliver out, put a steel beam, vertical beam in there so it would support the container as I started cutting the walls at, out at that point. Because otherwise, what these will do is they'll do this. They'll start to bow down. The container will because it loses its structural integrity when those walls are cut. So there you can see a picture as I'm actually cutting it out there and it, those things do get pretty darn heavy and you've got two sides of course you gotta cut so it's a lot of cutting. And How many times you cut yourself or something like against it? Lots. I've got several scars from it too. You set your pants on fire a couple times? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've had I've had um, metal fly back on me as I was cutting it. Yep. So there it is after the walls were cut out, and I, as you can see, I put two four by fours in there in the back of it. Um, the back of it right here. That's the uh, vertical support beams I welded in place, so the, the back was fine. But it needed these two beam, these two four by fours, to hold the front up as I was getting ready to put the structural reinforcement in the front. You don't have to worry about a 4x4. A 4x4 uh, uh, vertical down pressure on it can take 5,400 pounds. So I've got 10,000 pounds that it could hold back with those two 4x4s right there. So there's my Jeep. I'm getting ready. I've already got my steel cable hooked to it and I'm getting ready to start pulling my uh, main support beam up in there. And there it is. That's a um, that's a three eighths inch. Well, I'll take it back. That's a um, eight inch I beam that I'm pulling up, and that was about a 425 pound beam that I pulled up in place to get. It. So basically, I just hooked, put my uh, 
put a pulley there and a pulley there and hook my cable from my Jeep up into the pulleys to pull that uh, beam up. And I'll tell you right now, it fell on me several times until I got it perfectly uh, centered on that beam that it, would, it, would, um, it wouldn't do this or this as it was going up. So there it is. That's when it was about halfway up. And believe me, I'm pulling that Jeep up really, really slow as I'm going. And there's three fourths. And at this point, you can see I'm putting straps, those 700 pound straps on both ends of it to hold it up. Because at this point, I can't go any higher with the pulleys. It won't pull it up. So what I'm having to do now is uh, I've got two 700 pound straps on each end and I've got to take that chain off in the center and remove that and then use those straps to slowly pull it up until it's flush with the ceiling. At which point, there you go, it's flush now. And once I got that up there, and yes, my wife got really angry with me, the fact that I did this by myself. You did this by yourself? Yes. <laughs> she wasn't the she wasn't the happiest with me that I was doing this stuff. This is where you find oh, six oh, really good friends and a six pack or a case of beer. Well she she told me I'm bullheaded, so <laughs> she actually told me that again this weekend. She was right. <laughs> 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 she was like, friends behind the camera and they're like drinking a beer. Then who is camera? Well that that's why you haven't seen anybody else here. I've done most of the work myself. So <laughs> So once I finally got it up there uh, like that, then it was ready for the vertical beams. And there's the, one of the vertical beams and the other one. I put them under it, and then as you can see, I got them uh, welded in there. And once I got that in, then it was more secure. Uh, but I thought that was it, and it wasn't. <coughs> yes. One of my engineer friends told me that when he, actually an engineering firm over in uh, Paducah came by, they, they were curious and wanted to see it. And they said, if we can just see your house, we'll give you some advice on it, too. And they told me, they said, you need just exactly what you said, lateral. So, which I'm going to come back to that here later on. So then, my next idea on this was, I don't want air conditioning. Typical, traditional air conditioning. So I chose earth cooling tubes instead. Earth cooling tubes, and you're probably thinking of geothermal, where they run water through lines. Well, these are different. You run air through them. So what I did was, I got the guy down the street from me to come and bring his backhoe out, and we trenched out 85 feet of uh, trenching 10 feet down in the ground. Starting at about three feet down, the temperature never uh, goes above 58 degrees here. So we put, what I did was, I went and bought culvert piping, and we ran it uh, 40 feet down one side, 40 feet down the other, and then five feet across. And you using it for heating and cooling? Just cooling. Okay. I am though, uh, I will tell you this, and it's interesting you said that. I am going to, I'm thinking about trying it this year since winter is here while we're gone and maybe having solar panels just control the fans to blow air through it and see if it will heat the house to at least in the 40s or 50s when it's really cold. It seemed to be in a wooded lot that Joel Smith had put a wood burner in there. No. Uh, we're actually, uh, I, I went against wood after all. I was going with it and we actually ordered this week propane. Okay. So there, there's a picture down the trench that's 10 feet down in the ground. And there's a picture right there of the whole thing. And I know it doesn't look as much or that far, but that's 40 feet coming down and 40 feet back and five feet across. So there's the tubes coming into the side of the house now. And there's where I had cut out there and, and uh, um, put the tube through the um, bottom of the wall. Oops, one on that wrong slide. And that, that's basically my earth cooling tubes. Do you have to worry about insulation? Yes, I just actually did the insulation here about three weeks ago. Yes, it definitely needs. You're, are you talking about for the tubes themselves or? Sure. Well, the, the, here, uh, some people said to me, they said, well, well you, you've done wrong because you use plastic, PVC tubes. You should have used metal because metal would be more conductive. But I've actually, the reason I didn't go metal is because it only comes in galvanized steel. You need special equipment when you weld or cut galvanized steel. Otherwise, it's toxic. So have you, have you used it yet? Yes. 
And does it pull water or condensation in the corrugation? It the has. It, it did at first before I started um, using a dehumidifier in there. There you go. There's the key. Yes. Yes, you're exactly right. Yep. So the next thing was coal tar epoxy. All right, I know this is uh, Corten steel, and Corten steel is designed to rust and still be good. But I also wanted extra protection. Once it was going to be put underground, I don't ever want to have to dig it out again. <laughs> so I used, um, when I was, Microsoft flew me out to Seattle uh, last year, I actually met a guy out there, another admin, that his dad worked in the oil industry down in Louisiana. And he said, you need to talk to my dad. He, he coats um, tankers all the time down there, and he can tell you exactly what to do. So he put me in touch with his dad, and his dad said, use coal tar epoxy. That's what we use on all the oil wells on the tanks that uh, hold the oil. He said, you can't beat it. And I started Googling, doing research, and it is. It's one of the best. It's not cheap. It's $110 a gallon. It's not cheap, but it's well worth it. And it is toxic, too, when you're using it. So you gotta use you know, your normal paint mask. And you, and you get it on you. I've still got a little bit from last week on me. Never comes off? No, you have to shed your skin. And uh, everything that you own is now covered with it? All the outside is, yes. Yep. So that was me. I went ahead, as you can see all the little uh, things there, I went through and sanded all of it down. And that's the epoxy that I put the first gallon on. I took two gallons for each wall on it. And there it is. Of course, there's a little color difference because I had just done this one. But that's what it looks like after it was epoxy. How did you apply it? Roller. Paint roller. Because it's really, really thick. I mean, when you it, it has an activator and then it has just tar in your, your one-gallon can. you got this little activator and you've got to use it. What's uh, the working time on that? One hour. Ooh, go fast. <laughs> go really fast. Yes. Yes. And Granger is the only place you're going to get it here in Nashville. So that was it. That was the, the back wall when I did it. Or the, I'm sorry, the side wall. That was actually, as you can see here, I had not put my cooling tubes in yet when I did that. And then came the doors and windows on it. So there's where I had just finished plasma cutting the first uh, window up. Before this, when I'd go there, I had to leave it unlocked because the shipping container, you have to uh, lock it from the outside. So I had no way to get in and out, so I had to leave it unlocked when I slept at night. So once I got this window started cutting out, that's it as it was cut out in the back, which is a view of my backyard. And there's after I got the window put in. Is that a standard Menards window? Yep. And there's a picture from the outside of it. Basically what I did was I took uh, two inch square tube, steel tubing and welded it to the, um, after I cut it out, welded that and that became my window frame. And there's a view of it from the back uh, after it got the first window. And that was nice because then I was able to open close and crawl through the window and be able to lock it up at night <laughs> and not have to worry about and someone. And crawl back in. Right. <laughs> So then came my second window, I cut it out, and I, actually there's a picture of me actually using the plasma cutter. Uh, <laughs> yes! <laughs> oh, believe me, when I was doing that, it was in midsummer. it was hundred, almost 130 degrees inside there. It was, it was, yeah. Sparks under your leg are a lot better than that. Yes. <laughs> well, he had enough sweat going on, it just sizzled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back. <laughs> right. So there, there, what I was telling you there, there's your the frame, the square uh, tube framing that I had put in on the second window, and I did the same way on the other one. And once I got that welded in, then I started on my door. And the door was a little different because the door, a lot of that steel had to come out, and that structurally compromised that wall of the container. So the first thing I did was just like I did the other part when I started cutting the inside walls out. I just cut a sliver down of it so that way I could put in my, as you can see now it has it right in that picture, I was able to put my vertical steel tube in there and be able to uh, structurally reinforce it before I took more out. And as you can see there's one of the tubes and there's the other one. Now I'm right, I was able to go ahead and cut it out and there you go. That was after the uh, whole side came out. 
and there's after I got all the tubing put in place, and there's the door. So that got in. Yep. So basically, what I did was, is once I got all my framing in, then it was just able to be pushed right into the, the frame at that point. Is this before the epoxy then? Yes, on this side. Because I did uh, bought two gallons at a time and just did each side, because you're talking $200. That's right. Yes. So, I, and then plus the reason I waited on this was. Because I knew on this side it was going to have the doors and windows, and I wasn't going to need as much epoxy, so I didn't want to buy too much and just waste it on that. So that's after it got installed, and there's the back after I epoxied it. Um, that's what the back looks like now. So then came the telephone pole. I wanted high, I have to have high speed internet over there. <laughs> of all of everything else, it's, I know, I know. I'm not so I, crap, but I need my internet. Yes. <laughs> it's the Facebook. Exactly. How many yeah, links did I it was a my picture? You could just blame your wife. That's true, that's true. She, she needed she Facebook. Had to have it. it was the deal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I needed it, and they were like, well, you got to have a telephone pole. Well, uh, one of the things I found out about telephone poles, they're expensive. Yes. $2,000 a pole. Whoa. Whoa. What? Yes. How, long, how long was your drive? Trees are huh? How long was your drive? <laughs> Get over there? Yeah, the driveway. Yeah. Oh, um, it's about uh, probably 30 feet. Oh, okay, so one pole. Yeah. So, luckily enough, the construction guy down the road that came in with the back of it, you've seen, he had extra poles laying in his garden <laughs> so you can have one. Oh. <laughs> you guys number. I know. <laughs> how much beer? were you into at this point in time when this idea came up? Hey, you could just have one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is actually, I uh, never saw myself installing a telephone pole, ever. So this is actually, you dig it four feet down in the ground, he brought his backhoe down, dig it four feet down, and there he is, pick the pole right up. He just brought it over with the backhoe. So. Yeah, and then we just put it down, and then while he held it up with the backhoe, we just, uh, I took rocks and you just put rocks down inside the hole and then just pound them down. Not and quick free or anything? Nope, you don't need any of that. I know, I, I knew nothing about it. He had done it before, but, because his son works for CEMC, so we. Telephone poles don't have any lateral movement, as you've seen, they're, they're balanced, so they don't wiggle a whole lot. Yep. Oh. And so you don't need to put them down. So and he's just looking good. for ways to use the back of it. So yeah. <laughs> this has been the backhoe show. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Bam. And then I got high speed internet connected the next weekend. Productivity so went down. Oh, the phone line or you well, I just got high speed internet's all because I because uh, we or? well we use Apple TV, so we've got a um you know we can watch TV over there now and um and then I need our I need remote uh, desktop for work sometimes, so I got a remote in. So I'm trying to figure out how you got. We well, here, here's the funny thing. Was it Another DSL thing that or cable? No, it's cable. Cable. Okay. It, the land to make sure it was in the window. Well, this is this is what's so weird. So when you go into Dover, long time to think about. Yeah. You go into Dover, you have three G. But when you come out where we're building out onto the trace, it's one of the only areas that we have four G LTE, and we have high speed internet and cable. So up. That's another thing I've really been lucky on on this house. We've gotten lucky so with uh, to buy the right parcel. Yes. <laughs> the right parcel in the right spot. Yes. If you need high speed internet for your job, can you write that off your taxes? Oh, if, you, if, if you work from home for a percentage of your time, yes. Ooh, I don't. It's only on emergencies and. If you're on call, then oh, you, that's you true. get a certain percentage. You can talk to the tax guy to get it particularly figured out. but. There's mm. a percentage you can't claim as your text, but you do have to itemize. Interesting. Thanks for that info. So and also all that energy star stuff you just did? It's all tax. I know. It's I'm all tax book. Yes, and that ends December 31st. Mm. Until they extend it again. Yes. So it was supposed to end about eight years ago, and then they renewed it. Yep. So next came clearing the land. We had already cleared for the house and stuff, but when he came down and we installed the telephone pole, it was that... I'm just gonna go ahead and clear your land. He said, and don't bother with it. So there he, he brought his other backhoe, or his- The bobcat. Bo well, I guess that's what it is. 
He's got one. He had one that had the um, steel cage and everything for being able to go back and push trees over and everything for me. So he went through and cleared, as you can see, cleared all my land off for me and made it a lot nicer to work on. So then came the reinforcing the roof and walls we were talking about earlier. So there I am. That's me pulling up the, uh, I used a hoist there. And that's what you were talking about on doing the lateral. Right. Yep. That's what one of my engineer friends told me. He said, you need to do this. Because what happened was, if there's ever a tree that falls on this, when you walk, it bows. If a tree fell on it, it could literally crush the house right in. So that's why it needed these um, beams to go down the length. So I put these in and welded it in. But now I'm also extra protective and extra secure. So what I did was after that, I put chains around. These, it has hooks. If you come back here and look, there are these hooks right here, and each one of those hooks can hold 10,000 pounds. They have a, a force. So basically I took chains and put around those hooks and around the beam, so if something ever happens to the weld, something falls, I don't have to worry about the beam coming down and crushing it. Between the two yes, that goes all the way down the center of it, yes. So there I am where I was pulling the second one up in place and welded it. So while you're doing this, I see you're using the pulleys to hoist it up in the mm -hmm. center. The weak point of the roof is what you're using as your pulley. That, yes. What I was thinking. Yes. But was it, was I, it buckling down a little bit while you're doing it? It get did a little, little bit. Get a little scared? But I'll show you what I did. There's how I got the buckle out. Oh, there you go. Okay. Just use the roof jacks. Or the yes. Board. Those house jacks I put house under it. And, and I put two of those, and then that pushed it right back up. But yes, you're right, it did bow it down some. Make a groaning noise, especially. Yep. So once I got that in, then I welded that. And you can see, here's the, the, the big beam, the first one that I had welded in place. That is so strong that it just holds this beam in. And then those two vertical ones, the first cuts I did in there, that's what those two were welded to. Is it sitting like in the lip? Yes, okay. yes. The beams that you put up are rated for like 70 or 80 foot spans. Just thought you should know that. Oh, yeah. They told me, they said you went way overboard. But I'd rather go overboard than not enough. You, well, now you can have a second story. That's true. <laughs> yeah. If you wanted to, you have enough support. Well, actually, this part right here, these these uh, corners, of it, they can take 150,000 pounds of downforce. They stack them with 20 high on the ship? Yep. So, so they're strong. It's just the walls that are not. Uh, and there I am putting the main one on, or the, or the last one in the front. And, and there's a better picture right there. That's what I did. I put the chain around those so that way I know that they're permanently secured there and nothing. If a well breaks, if there's an earthquake or something, it ain't going to fall down and kill me. So, but yeah, that's my Jeep. Um, so there, this is my next thing. So I had to buy these. Those are uh, it's about, I beams. It's about eighteen hundred pounds of steel. It is. Well, actually, that's eleven hundred pounds right there, of steel on the top. Well, with the rack. Well, I, yeah, I custom built that rack for the Jeep back in twenty eleven, <laughs> uh, that it could hold some, some was, weight. She was squat. Yeah, but yeah, I had to bring all those over, and so this is the part where I, when I went, decided I wanted to bury it, those walls would have crushed right in on me because you're talking twenty three hundred pounds per square foot of force that the ground pushes up as it's buried. So what was the plan? Was half buried was the, was the plan for that? Two sides are buried. Two sides were buried, okay. So there you go. So what I had to do is, is put these steel beams here um, up against that uh, wall. The wall is 14 gauge steel. So here's a better one. So what I did was is I came through with my plasma cutter and cut this out where it fit right around it. And then I just welded that in place. And then, actually I didn't get a picture, but I also welded another steel plate down here where there was just more weld coverage space on this. And there you go. I put them every four feet down the wall. I welded those in. And yes, they were well worth having. Four, I used uh, four inch I-beams. I know that was an overkill. Even one of the engineers told me, he said, dude, he was like, you went way overboard using these, but I'm like, I'd rather have be overboard than under. So those definitely ha uh, did good. So then the next thing before we could put it underground was drainage. Get the water up. Yep. So what I did was is I took uh, two pipes. This 
pipe right here is going to be my sewage pipe where my drains and all that stuff come through and be able to run the sewage around my house. And then as you can see, this pipe has holes in it. So any water that may accumulate down in when we bury it, it'll just run right out through this drainage pipe. Uh, and you can see like right in this part right here, you can see that little film, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a film that I put around it and that stops like um, uh, dirt from going down in and clogging the pipe up, uh, stuff like that. Did you say you were going to a septic field for this or? No, we don't need septic. Well, we, because because there's not going to be any what's called black water. Black water is... You don't poop either? Well, we've got a composting tool. Oh, that's right. Okay. Oh, it's all gray water. Gray water. And because it's gray water, you can let it flow right out onto your property. Just throw it out back here. Yep. So there's a better view. You can see that film that I put over that. So they're running around the corner. And that was all that was required for that. Now, then came the putting the container under the ground. And this is where I was scared. So he came back with the backhoe and started um, pushing the dirt in that they had excavated for me in the beginning. And I'm going to tell you right now, I was scared. Even though I knew all my welds were good, all those beams up and down the wall. One minute, sure. It was scary. So he started pushing it in, and of course he had to bring some more, his dump truck down, bring some more stuff. And there's after he pushed more up against it, and there's from the front. Yeah, here's another video that I took while he was burying it under. And I'm going to tell you, I was scared. I was like, it's all I need for the wall just to crush. If it's going to work. I tell you, you could have put that underwater at the Marianas Trench and like not <laughs> <and> collapsed. Four inch high beams, really? I don't think there's, I don't think it's going to come up here. Anyway, you get the idea when he started pushing the dirt up to it. Did so, you cover the roof as well? Just Maybe that's no, one just the sides. Like, I'd be interested to know on the next summer. Day. You put the cooling tubes in, uh, mm -hmm. which have also covered two walls. Yes. And so the question that I'm very curious about is, is just covering the two walls enough? Or are the, co the cooling tube absolutely necessary? Well, we're going to know that. We're going to find that out. Exactly, when it gets hot again next year. So here was the next problem I had. So when he put it underground, it worked fine. Those, All those beams right there held like a champ. Um, you, I tell you, though, when it started in, these did start to bow in some. I mean, every four feet's enough. But what happened was they bowed in some, and there was some space between the beam and the quartz and the wall, and it pushed that wall right into the beam, and then the beam held it fine. But my next problem came that I didn't even think about. This. It started bowing the roof. Oh, buckling it because that top corner? Yes, right because it was pushing so much force. It was pushing so much force here, it started to push the whole top up. And you can see right here a little bit of a bow right in that area right there. So I, I luckily I had some 4x4s and I ran and cut this 4x4 right there and put it right in place. I knew a four by four could hold it and hold it back. So it helped, it stopped it. And then I put another one there when he did that and another one there and then there was another one up in here. And I ran to Lowe's and Clark's for real fast and picked up a whole bunch of four by fours and came back. And then that's when I decided and actually it turned out to be even better that this actually happened to me. That it started to bone the roof. Because what happened was, so then I used right here on this steel uh, beam, I beam, so I put the uh, four by four between that and this wall here. Why was this such a good thing? It gave me in the end something to attach my um, Some screw to. Yes. It reinforced the ceiling and I was able to use my jacks to push it back out. It not only reinforced my ceiling, but then I had attachment points for the inside framing of the house. So I was actually happy this happened. Is your plan to insulate drywall? Or? Yes. So then came the roofing on it. So as you can see, I started doing the coal tar epoxy up there, and I started using styrofoam pads. Now I'm not done with the roof yet, but what I did was I installed those styrofoam pads, and there it is from the front, and that's 
all the way down. Now what I'm planning on doing in the very end of this is we're going to actually put grass up there, artificial grass. Oh. But the styrofoam, and I, this is another thing, a gotcha that I learned. I should have done this in the very beginning because I wouldn't have been burning up so bad. No, oh, white styrofoam? Is it pink or white? It's uh, a bluish. The bluish, yeah, it would reflect a lot of sunlight. Yes, I and should have done that in the beginning. It's a marginal R factor. I wouldn't have been in there when I was plasma cutting this. I wouldn't have been in a 130 degree Maybe container doing it. 25, but still. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what's the purpose of the, the grass? Oh, that just grew up. No, I mean on top of the... Yeah. It just went natural looking. Okay. Well, just it has, more it has, natural. It has a couple benefits. Um, one, it will last forever because it's self-renewing. Awesome, right? Um, it has a cooling effect. Yes. A very much of a cooling effect. You have to have I don't know, turf about that thick before it will work. And so that has a natural cooling effect, right? And so it, in terms of cooling and longevity, it's the way to go. Yep. And it looks pretty cool, too. And the government wants it to make it a hobbit arrow. Well, yeah, true. Certain, <laughs> 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 certain hobbits. So then came, after we got all this stuff done, the framing of the inside of the house. house was a shipping container. <laughs> <laughs> So then I started framing it, and that's when my wife actually started coming in and helping me at this point. All before I had done all that by myself. But then she came in and started helping me, and we started framing the inside out. And we raised it up. We didn't build directly down because here was the, one of the problems. This part right here where I showed you back earlier of having to seal that off, weld the two together, that plate, now it's up a little bit. Which actually, that worked out to be good too for us. So we put the uh, two by fours all the way down, and I put them on their side to raise the floor up a little bit. What's the height? They're 10 feet high. Okay. You should be able to get an eight foot seal. Yes. With room for insulation. Yes. Uh, pro tip, always buy twice as many two by fours as you think you should. Believe me, I did. <laughs> Believe me. Oh yeah, there's a lot of this. You can use them for a while. You know? I mean, yep. Like so there we go, we, we did that. And then uh, there's a special Advantech plywood that you want to buy. It's the best plywood you can get. That's OSB. Uh, uh, that one, well, that one is, yeah. That's OSB. But we use Advantech for all the water vulnerable areas, like the kitchen, bathroom, and then the floor. Because uh, you never know if you have a bad spill or something like that. Um, oh, you're doing a floor, you're not a wall. Right. We, we just did the floor. That, well, as you can see, we're talking about getting like, two by fours. Yeah. But anyway, that, that's the, so we had finished it there. That's the flooring, the, the subflooring that is. And then we started the walls, framing the walls out. Uh, and there, you can see right there in that part, that's where we had all our four by fours at the ceiling. And that gave us that connectivity there to, to frame out the inside. You're missing now, your second top plate. Do what? You're missing your second top plate. Well, yeah. <laughs> but now, one of the things that a lot of builders do is that they get this confused is this framing inside is not structural framing at all. You've already got your structure there, so I, you can frame it in there. And there's some gotchas I've learned about framing. It's not as easy as you think to do it. We had uneven walls at first. Yeah. So we started doing that. Um, that was right there, the pipe in there, the sewage pipe. Now, that went out to those two pipes that I showed pictures of earlier. And there we go, there's more of it. We were framing, starting to frame the bathroom out there. Um, so we got that part. Did you use framing brackets on the bottom? Yes. That was what was a lifesaver. You, they're not cheap. They're about a uh, dollar a piece. So they're two dollars a board. Those framing brackets are. But I'm going to tell you, they make framing so much better. So we got those in. Um, and then, that wasn't the best pick I got. but. Anyway, that was the main wall on the back, or what you would call the front of the house. Which is, the front of the house looks out back of it because we wanted more privacy on it. And then comes the insulation. This stuff is the best stuff you can get. I'll tell you this: if you're building a shipping container house, good luck finding somebody that will insulate it. They'll spray foam it for you. I called every spray foaming place in the area: Nashville, Clarksville. They all turned me down when I told them it was a shipping container. I don't know why. All I'm asking for you to do is spray foam it, but none of them would. 
So I found out, I went on uh, Amazon, looked up uh, Dow Chemical Froth Pack. This stuff's awesome. It's not cheap. I mean, it's $750 for two of those uh, for a can that covers 650 square feet. But from what I found out, it would have been almost 2200 to get somebody to come in and do it. And I had to buy actually two of these did things. Did you rent the gun or did you no, buy the gun? No, the gun comes in this box. And you got your A and your B tanks. These are uh, two tanks. They're, they're the same thing that you're using your gas for your grill, your propane tanks. That's what they come in. And uh, you, you basically you put two lines together and then both lines come into the gun and then uh, you come with a bunch of different heads for the gun. Because when you start the spray foam, you better already have everything ready because it will it will seize on you in the gun. That's why you get so many heads on that gun to swap out. So if you need to stop, so cleaning wasn't a pro. No, you just swap out the head. Yeah, okay. yeah, because uh, the the two chemicals come together right in the head of that. So I, I don't know much about spray foam. Is it sticking to the wall? Yes. Or do you have like and as soon as it lands, it starts blowing up like yep. a marshmallow. So and it's the yellow stuff that you put. Yeah, great stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah great. same stuff. And, but now there's two types. There's open cell and closed cell. And you want closed cell because the difference is open cell, um, open cell is not guaranteed on water. So if you have a leak, it can come right through open cell. But if there's a leak uh, happened inside there on me, with closed cell, it will it's sealed it right up. It can't come through it. So you definitely want to use closed cell foam. And closed cell, if you've got mold in there, which was another problem I ran into with this. If you have mold in there, closed cell will seal it off. And then it just dies because it doesn't have access. So there it is after I applied it. That's on the ceiling, um, one of the coats of it. Um, you got to screen it off before it dries, right? Yes. You got to do what? Screen. You have to take a board and shave it, I guess, kind of. Yeah. Otherwise, it is hard and it's impossible to move it. Right. So that was after it was done. And then on my two walls that are left exposed, I'm doing a hybrid insulation. That's what it's called. So this is your regular cellulose insulation. And there's a view of it from last weekend. Uh, we, were, we were insulating the walls in there with that. We already have the spray foam on the wall. And then we came back with this in front of it. Well, th what happened was I made a mistake, and I had uh, we had already done this wall, and we had to take the um, the plywood off the wall, and I, actually I thought it was going to go all over it; it just stayed in place. So, so that gives me so that gives me a lot of insulation on the two walls that are exposed to the outside to really be able to hold the heat and the cool inside on me. Because the other two sides are underground, so you don't have to worry about those being underground. I mean. They're facing, you know, in temperatures in the 50s. So I don't have to worry about those. So the only thing I applied on those was spray foam with no other insulation in front of them. So then comes the electricity. Uh, the, the house is not gonna be connected to the grid whatsoever. It's all completely solar powered. So the first thing I had to do is create my own cables and that's not easy. You have to use, literally use a sledgehammer to make your own battery cables. Well, that's what a, that special tool I got, and uh, and you have to hit it literally with all your might to, to crimp those cables because you're talking about four four gauge wire, four and two gauge wire here. Uh, there's my my rack right there. I started out with four batteries. Those are all um, deep cycle, uh, 105 amp hour batteries on it, and because that's a first picture of one of my solar panels. There's actually, it's not as good of a picture, I thought it was better than that, but that's my first solar panel, that's a, a 100 watt panel right there, and I've got four, and actually the fifth one just came in today, when I head over there tonight, I'm gonna pick it up from the house on the way, so we're gonna have 500 watts coming in there, of solar power, to, to basically what it'll do is it'll charge these batteries. Everything runs straight off the batteries in the house. Now that's one of the things I did in the house. The house is not going to be AC powered at all. Except for two uh, outlets in the house, everything's direct current. Uh, because what most people don't understand is almost everything, well, I'll take it back. 
a great deal of the things you use in your house are direct current. They just have that little fat box that you plug into your outlet that uh, inverts it from AC to DC. So I told my wife, I'm like, why do we, here's part of the problem is, if you invert it from DC to AC, you're wasting between six and 10% of the power right off. Inverting, that's why they have those big, um, well, I'm trying to remember what those were called in electricity. Uh, they dissipate the heat, because that's how it gets rid of heat that. Heat sink. Heat sink, that's it. That's why they have those heat sinks on them, because they're dissipating that, uh, converting that power from uh, DC to AC, so that's why you're losing that energy. And I told my wife, why don't we just go straight direct current on all the house? You can get DC light bulbs. Uh, we've got our fan to blow the air through the uh, air cooling ducts. Used a car fan that, uh, that cools your radiator. We were able to use that. Um, all, uh, all our lights are, my iPhone, iPad, MacBook Air, all that stuff's direct current. Uh, smoke detectors so it's it's not hard so i mean you have to get special adapters that don't do the conversion no actually i think i have well that's my uh that's my main your power charge controller should have usb outlets and everything runs on USB. well this is the charge controller right here from the the um panels so the panels come in and of course at this time when i took the picture the one connected the panels come in into those two terminals and then these two go to the batteries, and then these two go up here to the uh, fuse box, which I was gonna put breakers on, and I found out with direct current, which is why you've never gotten breakers in a car, is that breakers don't act fast enough for direct current. That's why everything is still fused. So I'm doing the same thing, so I used a marine um, fuse panel for it, and that's what I, I run all my, my electricity off of. Uh, which that's that's a breaker right there. It, I'm just getting ready to take down because I found that out too late. The breakers just don't cut it when it comes to direct current. So my most of my outlets in the house are going to be this. That's your two USBs, and then you have a um, a cigarette lighter in there. And so what you were asking is, like, uh, I guess I didn't take a picture. So my modem, for instance. Um, my cable modem in there, it's direct current. So what I did was, it had the normal AC line on it, and then it had the little fat box, and then it had this thin line going into the modem. I just cut the uh, wire from on the thin line side, and then um, uh, split it up, put a, a resistor on it, and dropped it down to eight watts, and then um, put a cigarette lighter on it. And then I can unplug it right into that. And then it just, it works perfect. I did that both with my cable modem and router. I've done it with our dehumidifier in there. That was the other way I got around the um, mold. Uh, our dehumidifier had the little box converting to DC. I just cut it right off and, and hooked up a cigarette lighter to it. So many things in your house can do that. We just did that with our new uh, CO, uh, carbon monoxide detector. It was uh, plug in the uh, AC outlet and I cut it off and converted it. So you, you, people just don't realize that so much stuff in your house that you use that's DC. Our hair dryer for the bathroom now that I bought, it's run straight off direct current. So it's, there's lots. I guess you did some things that are designed like a mobile phone? That yes. Because why would they have a direct current? Well, it's um, uh, 12 volt monster.com is the, the site I go on. And you're right, a lot of the stuff I do get is from uh, is for RVs. Yep. So the next thing is the water. Uh, I am actually haven't done a lot with that yet. Um, this weekend, we're actually, is gonna be the weekend we're gonna get water in there. So the first thing I did right when I started building it was I bought two water totes. They're 275 gallon totes. These are, uh, when you buy them, you want FDA approved totes. Otherwise, you're getting something that you can't, you don't want to put drinking water down into. Yeah, yeah, exactly, food gradients. So I got two of those, and actually we're going to uh, go uh, in the end probably with eight all told. That's a lot of water. Yep. Is it easier when you run out to go and get them refilled with your truck or have somebody come to you? Well, here's another thing I found out just a few weeks ago. Put and two more of these in the truck. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, these things, just to give you an idea of how much they weigh full, water is 8.8 .8 pounds per gallon. 
So that'll give you an idea of 275 gallons, how much that's going to be weighing. Are they, where are they keeping? Well, right now, these, these are, I just put them outside when we started framing the inside out. But they're going to be actually out front of the house. And we're going to build a, uh, um, a little shed around them. A water closet? Yes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. And it's going to have a little rain collection tower on top of it that'll collect the rain and drop it right down in there. And then we're going to have carbon filters that will uh, filter it coming in the house from there. And I just figured out actually yesterday how, because my biggest worry has been winter time, it freezing over. Now, granted, that's a lot of water, you know, volume to dissipate the heat out of to freeze, but still it can happen. So what I thought was is I'm going to use Fresnel lens in there and put steel plates around them and let the lens get really hot and keep the inside heated using those in the sun because here's part of the thing now like in the summertime it's it is really as you've seen in a couple of pictures it's really wooded out back and this was another thing i was lucky about in the house the house faces south so that's the, the direction when you put solar panels up you want them facing south so that's the first another thing i was really lucky about so what i'll uh, in the winter time all the leaves have fallen so you get direct sunlight all day long on it and that's enough that I think that will be enough to keep the um, a Fresnel lens shining down on those on that steel plate to get it really hot during the day. Because if you get one that, that's about this high, I mean, you're talking so those things can get as hot as 3,000 degrees. Those lens can um, when they're really focused. So that's I'm going to try that first. If that doesn't work, I'm going to um, my first plan was to buy what's called infra panels. And they're um, solar panels that basically give off heat, and it'd be facing south. So in the summertime, there's not gonna, it's not going to get any sun at all on there. And that, plus, I can cover the panels up in the summer. But in the wintertime, it'll get sun all day long and, and be able to heat the inside of the um, the shed up and keep that that water from freezing. So that's that's my plan for the water. Um, so yeah, and these you can typically get for usually seventy five to one hundred and fifty dollars. Um, the food gradients. They are a little more expensive than the, um, than the ones that have chemical they use regular, yeah, herbicides and all those. And so there's my latest picture actually. Um, to be honest with you, this is the last picture I've taken. I've gotten a lot of work done inside, but honestly, I've been working on it now for almost 16 months and I'm just tired and I want to get it done. And by the time I'm done every weekend now, I just don't even take pictures. I clean up and I'm gone. <laughs> but that was the last picture. As you can see now, I've got all my walls up. Uh, I've got my doors installed. And actually, you asked on the power. That's the generator I've used to. I've actually put 162 hours on that generator all told working. Um, and you can see right here, that's one of my cooling tubes that comes out. Um, that's actually the one that will be blowing into the house. And last weekend we got the, the, um, the brick wall put it in here, fireplace wall. That's where our propane heater is going to be. And we're getting this weekend we're getting the um, we're going to get the first of two 325 gallon propane tanks delivered because I want a total of 650 gallons of that on site. So I'm just curious, outside the hours, have you kept track of the cost? Yes. Right now, I've got twenty-one thousand seven hundred eighty dollars into it. That's not a lot, including yeah, the property. Your time, but that, yeah, does that include the that, that doesn't include the property? Yes. Well, not 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 the property. I mean, the property originally was we paid fifty-five hundred for it for the property. Uh, and yes, over there at LDL right now on the Tennessee side, property is cheap right now because it's so underdeveloped there. Uh, if you go up to the Kentucky side it's almost tenfold on LBL. So yeah, we are, that's how much we have in it right now, um, minus the property cost. And tools? Can we put those in your cost? Um, some of them I have. Uh, like this generator, we had actually bought this generator that last major snow that we yeah. had here. And just because we were afraid we were going to be without power, it was so bad. And but Maybe the plasma cutter? Yeah, the plasma cutter. Plasma cutter I paid about 500 for. And I already had the compressor to go with that. Those, if you don't, if you buy a plasma cutter with the compressor, you're talking a thousand dollars for a plasma cutter. The welder I already had on hand. Um, most of the tools I really 
had quite a bit of those already um, from other projects I've, I've done before this house. Um, of course, you can see that's my bed right now. I just got to blow up bed over there. It's also grounds. Yeah, exactly. So but if we wanted to follow this project, do you, do you have it like a web page or? A, or it's on my LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn yeah, that wouldn't be my <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I started out and I didn't think about it, but when I started doing it on LinkedIn, um, it was, I figured, I'm just going to do a you know, small blog. I didn't realize it would end up being 215 pages long. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> I've had a lot that I've blogged out there on this. Um, the gotchas, I think I told you a lot of the gotchas. A lot of the gotchas that, that got me on this were stuff like, the the mold that one of my friends had warned me and then all of a sudden bam it it condensed because what the problem is when you're using a steel container it will uh, you'll have warmer inside colder on the outside and then it condenses that into water droplets inside and it molded started molding all over on the container on the inside so of course I bleached it all down killed all of it and then when I put the spray foam in there that stopped it all together mold so that's one of the gotchas right there that I, that I learned um, one of the other gotchas is make sure you, you wear uh, when you're doing spray foam make sure you wear a hair or something over your head and it is an absolute mess when you're doing the ceiling when I did my ceilings I didn't think about it I had it in my hair I had it all over everything inside the hat there I mean that whole shelf was just flooded with uh, little speck of, specks of that spray foam all over it. And there's no cleaning that stuff up? Well, you shovel. Shovel. I had to use my, uh, my um, uh, scooping shovel. Cold shovel. Yep, cold. That's what I was trying to think. Use my cold shovel and I just went through there. And you can see some marks still there where it was. And you just got to start shoveling it off stuff. Luckily, it was before we did the walls in there and got that um, that in. But now my next thing on this is that all these these plywood walls, those are going to be covered with um, uh, wood planks. And so is the floor. We're doing, um, and actually it's not going to be true wood. One thing I learned when I was researching this is we're putting in uh, composite flooring in there, the composite wood, that uh, actually laminate is what it's, we're actually using. You can actually use that on walls instead of using actual real wood you can use laminate wood looking uh, wall flooring for the walls too uh, armstrong which is what we're using has a full web page on how to do it so that way we never have to worry about it. if it gets too cold is the wood gonna um, bow if it gets too hot you know if it gets too humid laminate is going to last pretty much forever in there for us so we're doing both the walls and that and then the ceiling we're going to use drop ceiling after that and actually one of the things that and I don't, I've never liked this kind of drop ceiling at all but the stuff I've seen at Lowe's I was like wow um, one of the uh, upscale um, Indian restaurants in downtown Nashville had there's the first place I actually saw it they had drop ceiling and they had 10 um, inserts in there and I mean it was awesome looking and then I started researching and they have really designer style drop scenes you can do that just don't look kind of cheesy like this anymore so we're, we're going with that we're going to do the wood uh, wall look wood floor look and oh the commode so we're going with uh, a uh, uh, the commode we're going to have is not going to be connected to anything it's going to be what's called a composting commode so basically what happens is, is uh, when you go to the bathroom, it goes down into a, um, a reservoir and it has peat moss in that reservoir, special type peat moss, and it literally converts all the waste into a peat moss form and you just dump it outside. Take it to your roof. Yep, exactly. So is there, uh, is there water involved in the system? Yes, okay. it, it has, uh, and, and because it's a composting commode, it, it's direct current. You can either plug it into an AC outlet that'll convert it, or you can plug it directly into a DC battery which is what I'll do and um, and you have to have your um, your stack your um, um, to go out the, up through the roof so that you can vent all this out the smell of it so 
does it make the property spell back? No. No. Okay. No. Nope. So you have you tried after Indian food? <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet. <laughs> Luckily, they don't have Indian over there in uh, at LBL. So. <laughs> But that, that's what we're going, and that's our main thing with the, the sewage, the black water thing, is that if we can, since we're going to have a composting commode, we don't have to worry about black water. So you can just let, we can let the shower water and the sink water run right out in the backyard. And they can't say anything to you for that. Did so, you, oh, go ahead. Did you price out, like, uh, just septic and, and that whole route and yes. decide against it partly on price? Or yes. Okay. Um, and the, the cost of hookup to water, hook up to electricity. I'd actually thought about, you know, why don't we hook up and see if we can sell the power back. And we were looking at $8,000 to hook up to the local utilities. And I'm like, for a weekend house that we just want to go to, it's already off the grid, no thanks. And yeah. So one of the gotchas on this was that I learned, all right, the sewage part didn't work in the way I wanted it. So I ended up cutting those off and right in here, this is the bathroom right here. I ended up cutting a hole in the wall here and I ran my sewage pipes right out the back. So I have three sewage pipes that run straight out and they drain right out into the back of the yard and they're gonna be right underneath the deck. So nobody will ever see them. You know, it's just Shower. great water. Shower. Yeah, so it's not like it's uh, dirty or gonna be smelly or anything. Um, so that's how we ended up doing that. And I ended up just closing up the pipe that I put around. The drain pipe that w was underground still is functional, but as far as the sewage pipe, we abandoned it. And here's one of the reasons why, because we changed this bathroom here, it was originally gonna be on the wall in the back. And then we were like, well, we want a big bedroom. So we moved the bathroom out of there. And that pipe, we would have had to have run down, let, uh, cut off some of the wall in the bedroom, and it was just gonna be a, a huge hassle and that's another thing like I was saying earlier it's going to change no matter how you have this thing designed out you're going to have changes good luck <laughs> on that is the pipe under the floor or? yes okay. when you remember when you I showed you the uh the picture where I had the two by fours on their sides and all that well that that gave me that advantage to be able to put it right underneath that and right through there so it's it's under that floor now so I got the shower installed last weekend, and I've got the um, the sink in the bathroom installed now. Sewage is this weekend, so I've got right now on order the hot water. Um, there's a uh, gas-powered hot water heater now that we can get works straight off the of propane. So we've got that on order. Um, pumps, the water pump for water pressure in there. They're really cool. They only work when the uh, pressure gets down. So when you what it does is it, it will um, build up pressure in the uh, lines in the house and then when you turn the faucet on it will um, it'll sense automatically that old oh, pressure drops so I'm gonna turn on so it doesn't stay running all the time big non mobile RV yeah exactly exactly so I'm putting all those in this weekend Why not? I thought about a well uh, actually a guy down the street has has a well from me it's just that honestly I didn't want to come I'm getting kind of tired of the project now and I want to get livable and I just want to shell an extra four grand is usually a good that that that's too. a good turn yeah yeah and you got to get all that you got to get the drilling in and all that yeah and you got to get permits for it yeah it, it's well the same thing having it perked um, if I'd had the land perked I would have had to have gotten permits for that. So that's the main reason I didn't do any of that. Um, and then I've gotten people ask me, well, what do you think about ever being able to sell it? I don't see any problem with ever having, uh, I would have with selling it. And the reason I say that is because MLF, I don't classify it as a doomsday prepper house. There are plenty of homes over in that area that people have built that are doomsday prepper houses and they had no problem selling them when they, when they got rid of them. So I don't really, and then plus there's a lot of hunters that come over there. They just want a weekend getaway place. They can come over and stay when they go hunting. So I don't really see a problem of ever being able to sell this. Have you turned into an Airbnb? Actually, I've had several people tell me that recently. I know, I've, I've thought about doing that too. Yep, yep. 
so that's my next thing. So this week, as of this weekend afterwards, I'm going to have running water in there. We'll have um, our other solar panels. So we we'll have 500 watts. In the end, we're going to have a total of 15 solar panels uh, in there. And I'm going to, and I wish I could get them this year, but oh well. But yeah, they are tax credits, and I didn't know there's so much stuff I've done on this. I'm going to have a lot of tax credits this year. The spray foam is the insulation's tax credits. The windows, the door. Solar panels are all uh, credits I'll get, um, so I'm excited on that. So that's that's pretty much the gist of the whole project. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, if you wanna um, if you wanna actually look at my blog and everything, all you gotta do is go to my profile, Mick Pletcher, on um, LinkedIn, and I've got it under post. And I'll tell you, it takes a while to load. Give the obligatory. <laughs> Thank you.